Good afternoon. It's nice to have you all with us. I don't see many more people coming in, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, this is the session on achieving the aims of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and what is the role for finance. I'm your moderator. I'm Robin Millington. I'm the CEO of Planet Tracker. Um, for those that don't know us, we're a philanthropy funded financial think tank and we do analysis for example, from the point of view of an equity analyst in a main house, but what we try and do is integrate things, externalities that aren't taken into normal analytics and try and expose things like how well are company meeting, companies meeting their transition plans, where you're looking at greenwashing issues, et cetera, et cetera. So that's me. I have a wonderful group of panelists here today. Um, I'd like to introduce Ginny Ramos who is uh, with the Commonwealth, sorry, I, I just lost my notes, Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative. Jenny has a lot of expertise on corporate and financial law implications of biodiversity loss and ecosystem risk. And she used to be head of content at the Chancery Lane Project where she supported lawyers to use contractual clauses to tackle climate change. Um, in addition, we have Jessica, Smith, who's the uh, lead for the nature team at the UNEP Finance Initiative. She's promoting leadership on nature and nature-based solutions from banking insurance and in the investment industries. Um, she's the strategic and technical advisor and has helped set up nature initiatives such as the TNFD. Um, she also has a great deal of experience, which is very important for this conversation in indigenous people and community-led initiatives um, and gender initiatives, if I could add that as well. Keith Tuffley is co-head of sustainability and corporate transitions at Citibank and is vice chairman. Keith comes with a great deal of experience, has strategic and m and in finance and capital market solutions, investor engagements, Prior to this, Keith was CEO of the B Team. It's a group of 24 CEOs of global companies, leading entrepreneurs and civil society leaders, and has an active participation in the Paris Climate Agreement. So Keith will help us compare what's happening in the Kunming Montreal Agreement to what's happening in the Paris Agreement. Um, and then we have Johan Florin, Johan is with AP7. It's the default alternative within the Swedish premium pension system with assets of 90 billion and with more than 5 million savers. And Johan is an active member of the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures. Previously, he was chairman of Sweden's Sustainable Investment Forum and was of chairman of Amnesty Business Group in Sweden. So we have a great panel today. Um, I'd like to start. I just need to get a sense of who our audience is today. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you have been in a heat dome in the last two years? So a few of us. How many know what it means to be in a heat dome if you haven't been? <laughs> well, what it means is that it's not just hot. A heat dome settles in over the top of people, and it doesn't have much air, it, the wind doesn't move, and it's hot for day on day on day on day. And as we've heard in the news this morning, the current heat dome has had places like Phoenix having 47 plus degrees day after day after day after day. There's no escape from it. How many of you have been on a farm in any of these heat stressed areas in the last year? Okay, a few of us again. Have you seen what the front line looks like? The front line is really struggling. And people think, okay, there's heat out there, but how do you translate that and this issue of climate emergency into something that has a personal connection? And the way people can think about it, if you can imagine what it's like to be a farmer in Extremadura in Spain right now, or be a farmer in the north of Africa right now. It's very difficult to get water. Now, 
everybody thinks that water can be found somewhere. I've heard farmers, I was recently with farmers from Pepignon in France and Extreme Adura in Spain saying, it's all the government's fault. It's all the government not managing the water properly. I was just back from California and farmers in Northern California, which have suffered from drought for the last 20 years almost, it's all the government's fault. It's all the government not supplying water to us. But at the end of the day, with these extreme heats that we're now experiencing, if there's no water, there's no water. And no amount of management is going to make that happen unless we start looking now at investments into the infrastructure which will help create more water sources, such as how many of you are investing into, for example, desalination facilities? How many of you are investing into the water infrastructure anywhere? And how are we going to grapple as the heat gets higher and the water is declining? And that then affects the agricultural regions. And if you're in agriculture, we think that the decline of wheat, for example, is all due to Ukraine and Russia. But Canada last year was down 37% 37% in its wheat crops. North Africa, depends on the country, varied between 15 and 25% down. Iran, the largest exporter of wheat from the Middle East, was down. India banned exports of wheat. So we are now in a period, and I just heard on the news as I was coming here, I'm coming in hot from the States right now, that American wheat farmers are now thinking that they may lose 50% of their crop this year because of this heat dome that settled in in America. So when we talk about biodiversity loss, when you hear that term biodiversity, do you stop and think, this means food not on my shelves? Do you think about these heat waves and the climate emergency and think, we may not have the produce that we need. It, it's more than just a concept, it's something that's very real for all of us. And if we think we're gonna import our way out of it, import from where? If our imports are taking away from other people, where are they getting their food? And maybe we can, so we're rich, we can have a higher price on everything, uh, and we can pay a higher cost for the higher costs, but, what does it really mean? And so I turn to our panel and hope that you can translate this into, first, what are we doing to try and address it now? I mean, I want another show of hands. How many people think 2050 is a realistic target? No one, okay. <laughs> um, and then I just want one last show of hands. I don't again, know the level of knowledge in here, but when you hear us talk about things, when you hear GBF, do you know what GBF is? How many hands? Okay, half the room. I was hoping at least half the room. When you hear TNFD, do you know exactly what that is? Okay, good. Does anybody know what the G stands for in GFANS? <laughs> half the room, it's not global, and I'll let Keith tell you what it does stand for. Um, and finally, does anybody know what ENZO is? Oh, there are people here that do, fantastic. El Nino Southern Oscillation. So our whole global weather pattern right now is being driven by La Nina and El Nino. But does anybody know why this year is particularly bad or particularly different? So we've had an unprecedented three years of La Nina. La Nina is when the weather patterns in the Pacific Ocean cool the Pacific Ocean. The trade winds change and they blow the heat a different direction, it cools the ocean. Usually between a La Nina and an El Nino event, and the El Nino event is when the trade winds change again and create heat in the ocean. Usually there's a three or four year, what they call stable state. Normally a La Nina is one year, normally an El Nino is one year. Sometimes they go into very weak second years. This year we had three years of a pretty strong La Nina, I mean these last three years, and that La Nina has left the Pacific Ocean at the highest recorded temperatures and now we're flipping into the heating period and there's no stable state in between. We're going straight into an El Nino and if you're wondering where this heat is coming from, you have to look at that system going on in the Pacific, it's not normal and there is no stable state and we are now entering unknown territory. So Enzo, it's a website, go look it up. You can watch what's happening with the La Ninas and the El Ninos and they are impacting you here. 
It's hard to imagine sitting in Britain that it could impact you here, but it does. And it impacts the world. It rains in Australia, it's dry in the Middle East. So, you know, we have to be thinking about these things differently. Nothing is normal anymore. Anyway, with that said, I just want to bring those things home because I do worry that sometimes we use so much jargon that we don't think about what it means for our actual lives, us, our families, not just society as a whole. Um, so Jenny is, with her legal background, going to take us through a 101 of the Kunming Montreal Protocol and tell us what came out of the agreement that we signed. Thank you. Um, so it's very useful to see how many of you know what the GBF stands for. Um, for those who don't, um, it is the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, and that's what we're talking about, the GBF. Um, it was agreed at COP15 to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. So there are two types of COPs. There's climate COPs and there's also biodiversity COPs. The UN Convention on Biological Diversity is also referred to as the CBD, if you're coming across that acronym and don't know what it means. So the GBF replaces the previous CBD implementation toolkit and it is very much a tool and a political commitment, not directly enforceable. They also have a ratchet of country commitments copying the Paris Agreement system. Governments undertook to implement the GBF through policies and regulations and to align all their activities and finance with the GBF. This could create a transition risks for companies and financial institutions if they are not Kunming Montreal aligned or GBF aligned, or whatever the buzzword will be for that. I don't know, it doesn't have the same ring as Paris aligned, so let me know what sounds best, since we're talking about buzzwords and acronyms. So briefly speaking, the GBF has four overarching long-term goals to 2050, and then 23 specific targets to 2030. The four goals, very broadly speaking, are conservation, restoration, valuing nature, the use of nature, benefit sharing, and finance. But then the 23 specific targets, some of them have relevance to business and finance. So I'm not going to go through all of the 23 targets right now um, because I've been told not to take too long and we'd be here a very long time. But just I highlight the really, really specific ones that may have implications for the financial sector and, and obviously the corporates that they finance. So target three, um, you may have heard of the 30 by 30 headline goal of the GBF. That refers to the conservation of 30% of land and water. So this will lead to the expansion of protected areas. Currently, only 17% of land and 8% of ocean are protected. So as you may be able to do the maths, that's quite a big expansion. So that will have knock-on implications. It will affect extractive sectors in particular, like agriculture, logging, fisheries, mining, and their dependent sectors, such as cosmetics, fashion. And then obviously it will have risks for the financial sectors that are financing those industries. Target seven is to reduce pollution. That includes pesticides, chemicals, and plastics. And that could involve national regulations affecting financed activities. So again, that will have implications. Target 18, you may have heard of another headline, that's a subsidy reform. So this is a goal to reduce biodiversity harmful incentives by $500 billion a year. Again, this will affect the finance sectors that rely heavily on those subsidies, such as agriculture, fisheries, transport and energy. Now, a lot of you in the room will know about Target 19 because that's the, the one about finance. Um, that is obviously hugely relevant to the financial sector to mobilize $200 billion a year for biodiversity finance. So this will bring opportunities for both traditional approaches and innovation. Target 22 is really interesting because it in incorporates indigenous peoples and local communities, representation, participation, access to information and justice. Legal risks may come with this if companies violate those rights in relation to biodiversity. There could be human rights litigation and biodiversity lit litigation interwoven together. So financial institutions may want to mitigate that by promoting best practice within their portfolios. But what I think is the most interesting target by far in the GBF is target 15. A lot of people have said this is groundbreaking. So why are they saying this? Because it explicitly addresses the role of companies and financial institutions. And 
for this to happen in a multilateral agreement is, is quite rare. You don't find it in Paris, for example. So Target 15 specifically provides for states to require that all large and transnational companies and financial institutions monitor, assess and disclose biodiversity risks, dependencies and impacts, as well as supporting and encouraging all businesses to do so. So what is the finance sector's role in implementing this? States have yet to regulate to implement Target 15. I assume that they're waiting for TNFD to, to be finalised. Um, and um, Johan will talk more about TNFD, so I'll try not to talk about it too much. But what I really want you to, to take away today is that we don't have to wait for Target 15 to be implemented by states. There are two legal levers that already exist. So the first one is company law obligations on directors. And the second one is contract law obligations on companies. So moving to the first, existing company laws in most jurisdictions around the world already require directors to A, promote the success of their company, and B, to exercise due care, skill, and diligence in their duties. Very similar to investor fiduciary duties. If you want to know more about this, um, please look on the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative website. We did a report on directors' duties, but also on investor duties, there's some great reports by the UNEP, FI, PRI, and Freshfields on investor duties, the legal framework for impact, which covers the investor angle on that. But on the directors' duties, these are fluid, and they're assessed in the context of market, social, regulatory developments. Biodiversity risk is now widely recognised as a material and foreseeable risk. This is the context for these directors' duties in many countries around the world. But I'm just going to rewind and just look at why this is material. So all companies have some level of interface with biodiversity and nature. And it, it may not be immediately apparent, but Believe me, they do. I think I was um, on a panel with Robin recently where she said she pinched herself and said, look, we're all made of water. Um, you know, that, that we all depend on nature. So biodiversity and nature, we often use the words interchangeably. You've got the Convention on Biological Diversity and then you've got the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. So I just want us to focus for a minute on what they both mean. And I'm not a scientist, so hopefully I get this right, if there are any scientists in the room. Biodiversity is a characteristic or property of nature. Crudely, it's the variability of living things. It provides balance and resilience to ecosystems. In turn, ecosystems provide services, replenishing stocks of natural resources, pollination, water purification, to name a few. So biodiversity underpins ecosystem services and therefore the global economy. So when we talk about biodiversity and nature interchangeably, that's why biodiversity is that facet of, of nature, but it is nature that's providing those services as well. So I'm sure you've all heard this statistic, but in case you haven't, $44 trillion of economic value generation is moderately or highly dependent on ecosystem services. That's half of global GDP. And there have been studies by quite a few national banks now, like Malaysia, France, Brazil, the Netherlands, they've all found high levels of exposure to sectors with high dependence on ecosystem <coughs> services. So that's the dependencies. Turning to impacts, there are five drivers of biodiversity loss, change in land and sea use, exploitation of organisms, climate change, pollution, and invasion of alien species. Companies and finance activities are contributing heavily to these five drivers. So what does this mean for companies? Dependencies of company create risks and opportunities to that company. So for example, biodiversity loss affects income generation or supply of goods. And, and given that biodiversity loss is, is accelerating at a rate 10 to 100 times higher than the past 10 million years, you can see why this might be an economic problem for those companies. The impacts of companies on biodiversity also create risks and opportunities. For example, they may be affecting their own ecosystem dependencies, but also they may be affecting ecosystems which other parties are dependent on, which can lead to reputational risks or legal risks, and maybe litigation. There are emergency, 
emergency emerging biodiversity litigation trends where we can see impacts being traced across the world from Brazil, for example, activities originating in Brazil that, where litigation is being brought in France through supply chain effects, and then also, for example, Nigeria to the UK through the, the subsidiary parent company relationship. So biodiversity risk is a litigation risk as well. Therefore, impacts and dependencies are relevant to directors' duties. Even before the GBF is implemented, or Target 15 is implemented, and so even before the TNFD is implemented, actually. And so that is a lever for company and finance sector action. The GBF only accelerates and supports this. So what do you need to do as the finance sector? You need to, to take a lead to continue to indicate that these risks are considered material, because as we saw in the last session, the definition of materiality is really key in influencing the, these duties. Moving to the second legal lever that I mentioned, again, there is a role for finance sector here. Even before the GBF is implemented, contracts can impose legal requirements on companies. So investors, insurers, other contractual partners can use their transaction documentation to require, for example, TNFD disclosure. I think you're going to hear a lot more about this tomorrow in the legal innovations session, so I won't spoil it. Um, please do go along to that and, and listen to Matt Gingell from the Chancery Lane Project. But another thing that you can also use contracts to require is, is due diligence. Um, again, that's quite often found in transaction documents, so you can ask companies to do biodiversity-related due diligence. Again, this will also come through legislation such as the EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive or the Forest Risk Commodities Directive, but it can be accelerated through contractual commitments as well. You don't have to wait for the law. Once transparency is achieved, contractual documents can also continue to be used by the finance sector to drive implementation of the GBF through target setting, for example, requiring alignment with the science-based targets for nature, which have just recently been published. And then also by using quite clever contractual conditions to tie incentives into the deal structure to, to make biodiversity targets link in with the, the, the whole essence of the deal. Lastly, but absolutely not least, I do want to just mention double materiality. Um, so we had a brief discussion about that in the last session, but for those who don't know what it means, it means um, disclosure of impact of a company as well as risks to the company. So this has been set out by the TNFD and um, the GBF mentions impact as well. And that's an expectation. And I just want to kind of highlight something that was said in the previous session about investors only caring about risks to a company. I've heard a lot of people saying that actually investors, they have a portfolio that they care about that, the systemic risk to their portfolio. So they do want to know about impact materiality. And there's a word that I'm going to try and pronounce, it's sesqui materiality. There's a really good paper um, in, the, I think it's the Harvard Law Review um, by Rick Alexander of the Shareholder Commons. And that sets out much more eloquently than I'm doing right here, why, why investors care about this. So this will arguably accelerate achievement of all GBF targets if people keep it in their contracts and demonstrate strong leadership at systemic level. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that overview. Um, right. So the conference was run by the UN, so I'll toss to the UN to do the next, <laughs> the next view. And tell us a little bit, if you could, Jessica, you've got um, platforms developed to help implement the Paris Agreement. How is that going to incorporate, or do you have to set up parallel platforms? And how are you um, dealing, are these two things silos, or are you integrating? Wonderful, well, thank you, Robin. Yes, I am an international civil servant for the United Nations. Um, so I've been leading work on nature at the UNEP Finance Initiative for the last three years, and it's really gone from a sort of marginal issue to uh, we're suddenly very popular, uh, which is exciting. Um, so we are uh, an, an interface between the commitments that are made at the UN, like the Paris Agreement, the Global Biodiversity Framework, 
Also soon, the Global Plastics Treaty, and you may have heard there was recently an agreement on areas beyond national jurisdiction, so we'll, there will be an Oceans COP. There are others, including chemicals as well. But the two most known are the Paris Agreement for Climate and now the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Agreement. So we have 500 members from banking and insurance, and we work with the front end of the 5,000 PRI signatories who are asset managers and asset owners. Last week, we published a high-level roadmap for how all finance-related actors can help to shift finance in line with the global biodiversity framework. We also have dedicated publications that go target by target and department by department in the FI for banking and investors and one coming forward for insurers. And we will also have one coming for governments on how to interpret the commitments and the interest of private finance into their national biodiversity strategy and action plans and regulatory changes in their jurisdictions. So essentially, this topic was very much of interest and I insisted that I be a part of this panel to share the work that we're doing with our members. We're working with members who are voluntarily going above and beyond and trying to progress this topic. Around half of them are from European countries and then the other half are from other jurisdictions including North America, South America, Africa, Asia. So we do have the major banking and insurance regions represented amongst our members. As the UN, however, around two thirds of our members are Global South countries. Uh, so we do need to balance this global perspective of where economic activity takes place and where in this case biodiversity actually is. And you may have heard the stats around 5% of the world's Indigenous people are stewarding 80% of the world's biodiversity. Most of our world's biodiversity that is being maintained is being maintained in our food systems, and it's generally remote from economic activities. So when we think about biodiversity and managing biodiversity, in many cases, it's the inverse topic to climate change, which is often about industrial emissions. Not always, uh, and there are many linkages between, but sometimes we need to flip the script in terms of what we're actually talking about when we talk about biodiversity. So in our work, we are trying to get the financial sector to interpret and act on, and as Jenny said, you know, go beyond a compliance issue, but actually show leadership, but also systems change. So once leadership is shown, it gives regulators a signal of how it can be interpreted into law and regulation and become business as usual. So the Paris Climate Agreement had 2.1C, which called for the alignment of finance, the global biodiversity framework has goal D, and then very specific targets that are calling on specific action from the financial sector. And this was indeed not an accident through the long negotiating process. There were a lot of conversations between policymakers, negotiators, and private finance. And actually we have an agreement that really is specific about what it's asking from private finance and gives clear calls to regulators on what are the kind of actions that can be taken up within national biodiversity strategy and action plans and the efforts to actually interpret this into each country today. And I do want to mention um, Indigenous peoples and local communities and gender, as Robin foreshadowed, because the global biodiversity framework mentions Indigenous peoples and local communities 18 times and gives a lot of priority to gender. It also says that those who are stewarding nature, who are on the front lines of stewarding nature, should actually benefit financially from the financial flows that are coming for nature. So that is an absolutely important statement and a very different way of thinking. It's not only about the absolute quantity of finance and where it flows, it's not only filling the nature finance gap for uh, ecosystem management activities, but it's also rewarding nature's stewards. Hundreds of people annually are killed for protesting developments that harm biodiversity. Thousands more are economically affected or uh, politically affected. Now we are seeing that these dynamics must shift. The, we are literally, our societies are attacking the people who are defending nature, who are living with dangerous wildlife, who are putting themselves, their crops, their families at risk for biodiversity, and we are, we are literally attacking them. So we need to absolutely shift our mindsets and shift our way of working economically, 
But also, finance is an important lever for the real economy. So finance, you may be an arm's length away, but actually you're holding a lot of leverage and there's a lot more that could be done better. Now, often, you know, people have said it's unrealistic for the financial sector to work with indigenous people and nature stewards and promote women who are in agricultural areas. How can that be done? And I know that it does seem like a big gap in culture and ways of working and even geography and language. But one effort that I would like to talk about is our work within the Biodiversity Credits Alliance. So the biodiversity credits are mentioned in target 19 with UNDP as the first proponent. We, we held back initially because of nervousness around this topic and funding now from the Swedish government. Thank you, Sweden. <laughs> um, we have the Biodiversity Credits Alliance, which is establishing a set of integrity principles and an assessment framework for a biodiversity credits market that actually learns lessons from the failures that have already been demonstrated in the voluntary carbon market. So in this case, we are assembling a community advisories panel of indigenous peoples from the seven sociocultural groupings of indigenous people around the world with the support of the UN permanent representative for indigenous peoples and many representatives of local communities and they will be guiding the integrity framework to make sure that it is responding to the needs of nature stewards and if there is a credit market that it scales in a way that is fair and that actually reduces risk for investors. So we do have a paper coming out in September which explains how engaging directly with nature stewards can help investors actually reduce their financial risks. Because currently, if you have a project in the carbon market, almost none, and if you can find one, I'll be you know surprised, but almost none of those projects have a grievance mechanism where you can reach your investor. You can go to the project proponent with your grievance and hope that the proponent is handling it, but you don't have a way to reach your investor. And as an investor, that's information that I would want to know. If my project was harming people, probably it's going to collapse, it's going to face regulatory pressure to close down. So we've flipped the script in a way and written a, a paper which explains how engagement with indigenous peoples and local communities is good from a financial materiality perspective for investors, which will come out from the Biodiversity Credits Alliance. So I think I'm almost at my um, 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I'll hand back to you, Robin. Fantastic. Thank you, Jessica. I can't wait to see this paper, actually. Right, we'll pivot now to Keith Tuffley. And Keith, you look at this with a banker's perspective, and also you have such experience with the Paris Agreement. I'd love to hear your observations. Great, well, thank you, Robin. Um, well, maybe first to start with, I just want to emphasize some of the points you made at the start, Robin, uh, around you know the extreme <coughs> excuse me, temperatures and weather events we're seeing at the moment. Um, and the problem, of course, is not at the moment. Um, the reality is until we get to net zero emissions, just talking about climate for a moment, until we get there, we're going to have record upon record upon record of temperatures on average, and it'll go variability-wise, but you know, this, therefore, is going to go on for at least the next 30 years on current projections. And I don't think that's entered our mindset yet globally, that this is bad, but this is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until we get to net zero. And I can tell you, it certainly hasn't entered the capital markets yet. It's not in the psyche of, of capital allocation and boardroom discussions and you know, where decisions are made about where you lend or invest or support companies in shifting billions of dollars. It's just, it's just not in the mindset, despite all these years of scientific evidence and the Paris Agreement, et cetera. So that's one thing I, I, I always just keep emphasizing and um, some of my colleagues are in the room today as well. I know they keep emphasising this as well. Um, so I think there, there are lessons to be learned from Paris in relation to nature and biodiversity. Our, our focus here is on nature and biodiversity, but we all know it's integrated. Uh, we, we know we can't solve the nature and biodiversity crisis without also solving the climate crisis and vice versa. Um, but equally, they're also independent in many ways. Um, you know, the plastics crisis in the oceans is not being caused by climate change. That's just simple pollution of something that we've lost control of. And so we, we have to deal with both and we have to deal with them now. Um, I, don't th I know this is an environment where we can disagree with, with each other, I think, at times. And I think there was a comment made this morning about, you know, 
maybe nature and biodiversity can we can punt that down the road a little bit in four or five years. That's the answer is no, we can't. Um, we will not get back species. Right? We we well, okay. There are some efforts to bring back the mammoth, etc. Um, so there could be that. Um, but in terms of the, the true diversity and the natural biodiversity that we all rely on, our food systems rely on it. Um, you know, we, we need to tackle this now, and in fact, we're already, we're already in many senses too late. Um, on, on Paris Agreement, look, this is now eight years ago that Paris was, uh, was agreed to. The, I think the key uh, element there that was relevant to climate was, was um, setting the long-term target um, of 1.5 to well under two degrees by 2050. Of course, what that really was about is trying to set a budget for um, uh, uh, setting, set a carbon budget to achieve that. I net zero by 2050, which equates to a certain amount of carbon uh, CO2e that we can we can release into the atmosphere. Um, but it took at least three or four years for that to be turned into real action in the capital markets. I would argue it took until about 2019. And I think a, a similar moment was when Maersk, uh, of all companies, you know, big shipping company, very hard to abate sector, uh, actually announced their ambition to achieve net zero by 2050. And that was a real jolt to other companies thinking, well, how on earth can a big shipping company do that? And the answer was they had no idea how to do it. Uh, but the point is set the vision, get on with it, and, and then mobilise your, 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 your employees, your service providers to, to try to achieve it. And the other one, of course, and I think Anne was a member of um, one of the organisations, was, was the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, which is a group at the time, I think, of only about eight uh, asset owners that set up this mini collaboration. And it wasn't 130 bi uh, billion uh, of capital. It was a much smaller group. And of course, GFANG grew out of that. GFANG wasn't a sudden invention. It grew out of a uh, incredible leadership by a small number of asset owners. If it was AP7 a member of that, I'm not sure. It might, it might have been. But anyway. Yeah. No. No? We were a bit later. AO. <laughs> There's asset another one. Managers. Yeah, yeah. Paris Line. Yeah. So this, um, it was an, a key moment of real leadership by a small number of asset owners that said, we've got to work together to understand how we can achieve uh, net zero financed emissions in our value chain. And that then grew into Asset Managers Alliance and the Net Zero Banking Alliance. And that then effectively turned into the GFANS, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Um, the, 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 the key element of that is that measuring and managing down our financed emissions. And I know there was a question earlier on this morning about um, you know, what's the theory of change? Is it really that effective? Well, I can tell you at, at, at Citibank, I mean, we represent about 3.5 trillion of the 130 trillion, right? So when we talk about the combined assets of the, comp of the investors, banks, insurance companies who have made that commitment, it doesn't mean suddenly all that capital suddenly shifts, it just means a bank of, in our case, 3.5 trillion, that's our balance sheet, is now committing to that. But you can't just flip it overnight, obviously, but you've got to manage it in a transition sense and really do it and do it in a very logical and managed way. But the reality is it's way too slow overall. Now, it's eight years ago. What have emissions done since eight years ago? Well, they've gone up. They have not come down. The only reason they've blipped a bit was because of COVID. And uh, so some would argue it's been a, you know, we're failing. Um, but having said that, there's been a lot of movement, a lot of action, and, and on the ground, a lot of implementation. But the reality is we've got to look at the global picture and we haven't brought down emissions yet. So the reason I say that is because lessons to be learned for nature and biodiversity, we can't put that on the back burner. We can't, we've got to eat and chew gum at the same time. We've got to do both. Uh, and we've, they're both integrated and they're both urgent. And nature and biodiversity is just as important as climate. Um, if we end up with a world with a decimated uh, biodiversity, then humanity is in trouble. So it, it is urgent and we need to really, really need to accelerate what we've done in, in, in climate, accelerate it enormously in, in nature and biodiversity. So I've touched on GFANS. Um, Yes, we need to do the same in nature and biodiversity, a similar type of, of um, commitment whereby we somehow measure, in the case of nature and biodiversity, like what we're doing in, in climate, our, our financed emissions, i.e. what the emissions are for every single one of our counterparties 
And that's what we've done now with, uh, with, with climate. Every single one of our companies to whom we lend, uh, measuring and taking their scope one, scope two and scope three emissions, aggregating it, setting appropriate 1.5 degree aligned targets to 2030. Forget 2050, it's all about this decade now. We've got to hit this this decade and manage the, the capital accordingly. Now, for those clients, those companies who are not on the same trajectory, we therefore need to shift our capital. And of course, the danger is if there's leakage, I, those banks and other financiers who aren't aligning, they'll just pick up that slack. So that's why we need more banks and more investors to make that commitment, whether they're a member of GFANS or not, but they've got to actually make that commitment and get on with it because that leakage is, is very dangerous. The whole system effectively breaks down if, if we're just giving it to other, other financiers. Um, one other point I'll make before we then flip on to, for, for others is to say that um, there are obviously similarities, but many differences between um, a molecule of CO2 and other, other greenhouse gas, gases and, and nature and biodiversity. Uh, and one is obviously, one is, by definition with biodiversity, it's very local. Um, it's very um, spatially relevant in that sense. And so uh, that means we have to be, have, the data requirements actually be more sophisticated than they are for CO2 and methane and SOx and NOx, et cetera. Um, but the spatial aspect, the fact that we've got 30 by 30 is critical. Now, how we as a bank implement that is therefore different. How do we measure our scope three, if you like, our financed nature and biodiversity impacts when we're talking about what we need is put space aside for nature to thrive and survive. And uh, that, that creates a whole different other sphere of measurement, data requirements and, and, and management. And on that point, what we're also facing is, I think, a great battle for the, the, uh, our land and ocean resources. We've got 8 billion people on the planet today. We're almost certainly growing to 10 billion. It's not just the growing pot, which means more food. It also is the fact that we're increasing our wealth on average, um, which means more calories per person is increasing. So we're increasing the size of the population, increasing the calories that we on average want, um, so more space for food. On the other side, we're saying we need more space for 30 by 30. We're, we're now 17 and 8 today, going to 30 by, 30 by 30 in oceans and land. And on top of that, other sectors are demanding more biofuels and, and SAF, sustainable aviation fuels, which of course by definition is land-based requirements. So we have to recognise we've got three-way clash for land and, 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 and oceans now that we somehow need to resolve and that's why the, the food systems have to become so much more efficient in producing those calories because it has to require less land to grow more. Okay, well, thanks Robin. Great, that was a great overview. Thank you very, very much. Right, Johan, oh, by the way, did everybody now learn what G is? <laughs> <laughs> um, right, Johan, you're gonna tell us about TNFD, but also what are the needs in the finance world? What, what tools for implementation would be useful for you as a practitioner? I mean, what, what isn't there that we need to be putting in place? Um, mm. Please. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about TNFD, uh, but I'm going to do it from the perspective of a, a typical universal loaner. AP7 is a, a Swedish uh, government pension fund, uh, and we'll invest uh, globally. We have an equity portfolio with around 3,000 companies in 50 markets, all sectors, etc. So uh, you could say that it's very much a reflection of reality. The way the world is, our portfolio is. And the problems that are out there, we have them in our portfolio. And, and uh, we see, I mean, that's challenging in one way, but it's also an advantage as we see it, because we can start with the systemic challenges. If you have a concentrated portfolio, say 100, companies, you're going to have to start with 100 companies you own, because that's the only thing you can work with. But um, we, we, we have the privilege to do the opposite. We can start with the system and see what are the big challenges here and how can we deal with it. Uh, and um, 
Being a, a universal owner means that we own a lot of companies that other universal owners also own. So pension funds around the world um, have the same companies, we have the same interests, so we collaborate. And this is sort of a reflection on the panel uh, this morning. Uh, is there too much collaboration? Well, the way I see it, that's impossible because collaboration is the only way. Then, of course, you can have bad or good collaboration, helpful or, or effective or ineffective and, and failing. And that's another question, but collaboration in itself, I think it's the only way. These are global problems, so we have to um, get in line with each other's work. The, 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 um, the alternative would be sort of, no, don't talk to me, we're going to do our own thing, and I'm not going to tell anybody, and uh, we're going to do different things and report different numbers, etc. It would just be, it's impossible. So collaboration is key. Um, and we do collaborate more and more, and, and as climate action came up, I think that's a tremendous success. I know there's been critics, and it's not that it's solved every expectation there was, but it has an established a collaborative infrastructure framework, uh, a culture that didn't exist before. So just by doing that, it's been very helpful. And uh, when, this, uh, when the Paris Agreement came, for example, we were very enthusiastic and thought, this is great. It's the first time we has, have this type of global political commitment. So it's really a game changer. Same thing there. Uh, a lot of people think they have failed. It's not, you know, the expectations were much higher. Uh, I think it's wrong. It's fantastic. Only that we're not, we're not, we haven't accomplished the end task. And that's where I think we're going to have to put the effort going forward. Uh, what happened after we, we in, integrated the Paris Agreement in our uh, norm-based framework that we build all, all our uh, sustainability work on in 2016. And then we got a bit worried because then we realized there's a big gap here between this global political agreement with targets that is very high up and far away, and we're going to have to make decisions here and now in individual companies. We have to decide what is acceptable and not acceptable, what should we promote and what should we try to, in some way, get rid of or so. And the gap was so wide that you could have basically any interpretation. What does the Paris Agreement say I mean, when it regards to this oil company or this uh, food producer, etc.? So that was something we struggled with for several years. And um, the normal way we would go about it was probably to wait for more conventions, more guidelines, more, which is a normal way in the, in the finance sector. You sort of wait for regulations and rules and, and people telling you what you're going to have to do. It's just a bit of a compliance culture. We're going to comply when someone tells us what to comply with. In this case, we thought that uh, we cannot wait. Uh, we think it's urgent and perhaps we even can contribute extra here, being this universal owner, being exposed to the whole system with all the risks, etc. So we said we're going to you know, move ahead long before there are some sort of agreement around this. And that was kind of tough, because someone sometimes you, you think you have a good idea and it turns out it wasn't so good. For example, we started to engage with oil companies in the US built on Obama law. And then we had a new president and he sort of rolled all these laws back and the whole sort of what we built on disappeared. So that was yeah, so we had to rethink. We're going to have to do something else. Sort of. And um, in this way, uh, what was really helpful for us was the uh, um, IEA uh, roadmap that came in 2021. Because it, it was so specific in, in both sectors, what had to happen in each sector and at what time, etc. And our belief is that the best we can do um, as asset owners is to be active owners. So use the
the, the, the possibility we have, uh, voting, filing shareholder resolutions, litigations, we can take uh, companies to court, and of course, I mean, dialogue and all these things too. So. So we saw this as a great opportunity with this IEA uh, roadmap. And there was also two days later, Investor Agenda launched the expectations ladder around climate action plans, uh, which last week uh, included deforestation, which is really great. Uh, and we think that, you know, we're gonna move in this direction. They will integrate more and more. It's just unavoidable. So. Nature is one thing, uh, water is one thing, climate is one thing, etc. But they're actually, it's impossible to separate. So, and this is also a challenge. The complexity is just overwhelming. So when you look at, now I'm getting more into TNFD here. If you look at TNFD, I mean, the way I see it, you have, you have the global biodiversity framework, which is a political agreement. Then you had the TNFD. It's sort of a link in this chain in the same way as I described with climate and the Paris Agreement. It's, there's so much interpretation that has to be done. What does the Paris Agreement mean for me being an investor in this company? And it's the same thing with biodiversity, maybe worse, because it's much more complexity and it's local, etc. But this is the role of the TNFD, and that's why we just jumped on the possibility to be a part of it. It has, a, there has to be a lot of work operationalizing, making it concrete, sort of what to do and not to do. And the first step is reporting and uh, assessment and reporting. And this is the, the role of the TNFT. So TNFT, it's, uh, we're a member of the task force together with 40 under other organizations. We are two asset owners, it's us, and it's the uh, Norwegian uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, a bit more than a third is from the financial sector, so there's banks and there are asset owners, a couple, asset managers, etc. You have a number of key companies for this, um, developing this, that are sort of part of the, um, they have a lot of impact in this transformation, you might say. Uh, and you have some service providers uh, that will also have a, a, an important role, for example, when it comes to auditing and reporting. So all the big auditing companies are um, along uh, in this task force. And there's also a secretariat with about 20 people, a little more, uh, many of them experts in the area. And if you look at the process, it, it's, um, it's gonna be two years since it started. Uh, in, back in 2021, in September, we will have the whole uh, framework uh, launched. And it's been a very intense process within the task force, but also with a lot of companies doing pilots, testing this, coming back with uh, feedback. Um, the, the final beta version uh, was launched in April this year. And uh, then we had, an, so it's been number one, number two, number three, number four. And then we also have had an, another additional feedback uh, process after that, sort of the final parts of this. And, and I think it's just amazing. I mean, this is, it's, it's market driven and it's science based and the ability for so many different organizations to get together with completely different perspectives. Today we are talking what I've, what, what is the finance sector doing uh, with this? I, I think, it, if, if you should be honest, the finance sector is a lot of different parts. We are asset owners, we have one perspective. Asset managers have a completely different um, perspective on this. And of course, if you're an auditing company, you're gonna look at still different details. So for example, I think asset owners, as us, have a, a special, uh, responsibility because we are asking the asset managers to do we give them assignments we are their clients so we're going to tell them what we want if we do not ask for sustainability work and, and progress in this area we're not going to get it and and nobody else can ask them so i think this is a, 
both an opportunity, but of course a responsibility, and it's important that we take it. So all this work, I'm going to finish up very soon. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I think it's very helpful, and it's amazing to see uh, everybody work. It's not the end of a process in September. It's the end of the first step. There's going to be, if you look at climate, for example, there has been so many initiatives and things uh, after that. And uh, as uh, Richard with uh, ISP, SSB this morning said that the TCFD had a role and maybe it's, it's fulfilled now. And you don't know, may, is this going to happen to TNFD or is it going to move on? Thank you. That was great. It's a great overview. And it really is helpful to put the frame in place of what is happening right now. So many things came out of this. I'm not even sure where to begin. Subsidies, incentives at the C-suite, silos, um, collaboration, compliance culture. We've, and we've covered quite a number of things. Um, we'd love to open it up. What would the audience like to talk about? Anybody? Biodiversity credits. <laughs> the gentleman here. Um, hi, uh, this is a really great panel. Thank you guys for coming out. My name is uh, Sid. I'm a PhD student from Stanford, and um, I really uh, enjoyed the discussion about heat and the practical risks. And one question I have is with regards to agricultural biodiversity and what is the role for investment for agricultural biodiversity with an eye to resilience. You know, given that indigenous peoples, in many cases, um, uh, you know, have cultivated a much wider variety of crops than the small number of plants that we eat. If we are to live in this world, it's clear that indigenous people and their management of biodiverse agroecosystems has to play a central result, uh, um, role in resilience of the food system in the future. And I wonder what is the role the financial sector can play and in particular, what metrics also can be used to kind of make that vision practical? Jessica. Sure, absolutely. Great question. Uh, just about a month ago or six weeks ago, we published a uh, roadmap for transforming food system finance uh, with a number of partners in a a group called the Good Food Finance Network, where we've brought a number of partners together. And within that, we actually have uh, something called a high ambition group, which release targets for their portfolio. And not only, you know, climate and agriculture, nature and agriculture, water and agriculture, but social issues, labor rights, all uh, as, as um, integrated as possible. And we have different types of financial institutions, public, private, small, large, South, North, et cetera, in that group. Uh, so that's a fantastic resource. So when we're talking about bankable solutions, I don't know if anybody heard Bob Eccles this morning say, you know, we have maximum 500 billion bankable solutions in climate and less for nature and, you know, maybe less for water and maybe less for social. So, you know, bankable solutions is great. And if we can bring de-risking finance in, but actually, I don't know if some of you may have seen the paper from um, Katie Kedward and others at UCL around, you know, de-risking everything left and right is, is probably not the solution, is probably introducing, you know, new forms of risk. And some of the things that we need to do include, you know, provide public basic income, uh, philanth philanthropic support. Uh, one thing that I'm very excited about lately is the idea of project finance for permanence, where you have a site that needs to be conserved, you bring all the partners around the table, have a vision for that site. The people who are really frontline and at risk um, for their livelihoods in the immediate term, you know, get immediate support, and then you buy a bit more time to think about revenue streams and, you know, uh, bigger opportunities and, you know, what's, what's the area going to look like in 30 years, but those immediate needs are met right away. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your questions, but I do think, you know, we do need a degree of de-risking and there is definitely more scope from that, but that's not the only thing. And we definitely need, you know, I think when Johan said, we can't have enough collaboration. We literally have a huge challenge to meet. We have a lot of ingenuity, a lot of capital, but it, it can only work if we're all connected. And I think what the global biodiversity framework does well 
is it gives this whole of society roadmap to say, look, we need the public sector to do this. We need the financial sector to do this. Look, the role of women in agriculture is really uh, significant. And, you know, it, it basically gives us that, you know, big high picture map, which is now being translated by countries in their national biodiversity strategy and action plans of which the agricultural sector is going to be, you know, a big player. And agriculture is, you know, it's a big um, development finance, a big rural, uh, you know, strategy. It's a big, you know, climate uh, changing land use pattern. So, you know, this is really, I think, at the intersection of all these um, challenges. And actually, if we go back to the question you asked me that I slightly dodged around the platforms, is currently around a third of our emissions are coming from land use change. So we really do need to be joined up on, you know, halting the conversion of forests particularly, but also land, which is absolutely undermining our strategies in every other industry to halt climate change. Uh, so the, the topic of deforestation is probably the most urgent one at this intersection. And then in terms of the sector, the agricultural uh, sector and food supply chains are definitely at that forefront of you know, the, the, you know, the alarms right now. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Keith. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's a great question, and I'll give you a few pointers from a, from a banking perspective, you know, from a global bank, and it's not just City, there's a whole bunch of other global banks. So, um, so first, I, mean, I do think that food, as I've mentioned, food and water will be, I think, the front line of where we're going in the next, you know, I mean, energy has been because of climate change, but because of the physical impacts of climate change, because the physical impacts of nature and biodiversity loss, and because of a growing population globally, albeit some regions are declining population, but you know, 70% of the world's population growth is occurring in, in Africa. Um, food and water will be the front line. So therefore, the investable capital that has to go into the food systems has to substantially increase. And there's a whole bunch of ways that a global bank um, can assist that and facilitate it. And I'll just mention a few of them. So firstly, the comment was made about they may not be bankable. You know, some of these early stage innovations may not be bankable, but many are still investable, right? You, you, you know, to lend to, a, from a banking perspective, lending to a company is very different to, for example, early stage investing. And it's also very different to early stage, if like philanthropy. And most of the big banks have very large private wealth management businesses now. We interact with the wealthiest people in the world. When I say we, the big banks do. And there's both a responsibility and an opportunity to engage with them in a way, recognising that many of them are very, very talented, but maybe even more lucky than they are talented. Right? I mean, it's a global marketplace now. It's actually a lot easier to make a lot of money today than it was 50 years ago, because it's a global marketplace. Now, how do they use that money is the issue, and getting it into early stage to help make these emerging opportunities food systems to make them more resilient to your point um, is critical but some of them won't be bankable maybe not even quite investable yet and therefore getting the philanthropic dollars in there to help them become investable and then bankable is the is the chain we look at so um, private capital is, is continues to grow so being able to support companies not you know, pre-ipo stage but to access private capital is is a critical thing that all all major banks can can support um, most major banks have impact funds, and we, we've got a city impact fund, for example. That's our own balance sheet supporting businesses and, uh, and innovations and te technologies like this. And also research. Now, research plays a very important role to educate investors and companies and other stakeholders about the issues, the opportunities, the risks. Um, you know, our, our team has just issued one on, for example, the ocean, the blue oceans economy, and part of that is seafood systems. Um, so that's, that's another important element about how banks can support the, um, the growth we need in food and agriculture with a particular emphasis on resiliency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is very interesting with the indigenous people. Uh, being an old uh, human rights activist, uh, it's always been a problem everywhere and it's, it's sort of not, uh, it doesn't have a space in the modern society and, and you have to fight to, you know, in some way protect their rights. In this case, it's actually an opportunity. They can do the work more efficiently than anyone. So it's really, I mean, if there should be something that we can solve, this should be it. Uh, as a global owner with 3,000 companies, uh, we're not gonna be able to be 
active on that level. So we think within this, because there are so many layers of, in the supply chain and, and the bottom layer is, I mean, we can't even communicate on. And this is a situation for all. So the system in itself, which is part of the problem, can also be a part of the solution in the way that the big food companies, those we can engage with. And then we can ask them to engage with their suppliers and, and put up demands. And this is where we need global guidelines and expectations. So as soon as possible, uh, we get some kind of framework, what is expected of you. Then we can use all our, we can vote and file resolutions and even bring them to court. Uh, but that has to come in place. Regulation too, um, definitely. So from a, a legal perspective, I don't know whether you've heard about the innovation in corporate governance where, where companies are starting to put representatives on the board for nature. And there's also the possibility to do that um, with uh, to put an indigenous person on the board. So finance, finance could have a role to play in, in kind of leading to, to advocate for that within companies uh, and so that that will change decision making. So, so it's not necessarily bringing extra finance in, but it, it's changing the way things are done at that top level. Okay, thank you. Oops, sorry. Hello? Uh, Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the panel. It's excellent. Uh, David Clayden from Kaya in London. Um, I'm a massive fan of the discussion on how to think about finance and its relationship to biodiversity, but I have to point out that Citigroup was the largest uh, increase in financing oil and gas and coal in the 18 months after it signed up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance. And I think we need to be really credible. We need to be really candid about what is going on in NZBA and what's going on in GFANS. I think we can't have a panel like this and be serious about these discussions if we don't put our hand up and recognize some of the changes that need to be made. I, I guess that was directed at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, look, the best way I can answer that is that, y yes, we have to be honest. Absolutely, we have to be using all the data and all the information and transparency so we can all make collective decisions, individual decisions, um, to ensure we get on the right pathway. Um, this will not be a straight line, right? Just let me, let me, let me finish, yep. This won't be a straight line, I can guarantee you that. No, no matter what emission targets any company sets, investor, bank, whatever sets, it won't be a straight line to get there. And there may be at times up and down, right? And I'll give you a simple example. What if we come across a, client, a new client that we think is, wow, this is a really good, fast reduc reducing, uh, you know, reducing emissions in a steep curve but, you know, but to do that, they need more capital. And they come to us and they say, we need more capital in order to invest and to help you to transition. And that is a really good systemic transition. So for them, it's good, but for the system, it's good. Let's say it's green hydrogen as an example, right? It might be a company that already has emissions, but we want to support them to actually scale up green hydrogen. Now, that decision alone will increase our, our financed emissions, right? Just, that's just one example. It will increase our financed emissions. Now, do we say, oh, no, we don't do it because we've made this 2030 target and it's going to increase emissions today, but it still will achieve our 30 target, right? So that's just one example of the day-to-day -day challenges that I personally face and we all face, right? It is, not, it is not easy and there's a lot of judgment that goes into it. There's a lot of data, but then you've got a, there's an overlay of judgment. And the other, one of the other key judgment issues is you know, the easiest thing the banks to do today would be to, where's the low hanging fruit to reduce emissions? It's actually in emerging markets. It's actually saying, let's reduce the lending to Indonesia for their, uh, for, for in their economy. And none of us want to see that happen, right? So you've got to use judgment uh, overlay over the data to ensure that we end up with the right decisions systemically and for the, you know, for the sake of reducing emissions in the world. And by the way, the same is going to happen in nature and biodiversity. So, yep, we've got to be open, transparent. I don't mind having a battering from the audience. Um, we all deserve it and need it at times, right? So keep coming. But I'm just saying that it... Yeah. 
Yeah. We, just to be clear, we've done zero thermal coal, thermal coal financing, zero. Yep, zero. We are, no, I'm, I'm just telling you, we, we, have, we have, we are absolutely getting out of thermal coal, metal, metal, metallurgical coal may be different because we don't yet, that's, that's for steel making. Yeah. Well, let's, let's have a coffee or a beer afterwards and we can compare the data can and we then we can, uh, we can, yeah, for the, for the sake of other, other, other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can we move on? I think there was a, the yes. person here. Please stand up. Oh. Hi. Thank you to the panel. Um, fascinating conversation. And this is um, a question specifically for Jenny. Um, the intersection between law and biodiversity and nature is fascinating. You spoke on company law and contracts law. I'm wondering if you could speak to property law at all, as much of what seems to prevent conservation and regeneration tends to be conflicts over private property. And if you've seen any examples of um, where there seems to be progress on this issue, the Scotland's community right to buy seems to be a particularly interesting example, but how we start to tackle and approach property law in different ways for biodiversity. Thank you. Yeah, but I have to confess I am not a property lawyer, um, but I'll try and answer to, to the best I can. Uh, as far as I understand it, the, the, in the UK specifically, the Environment Act is bringing some provisions on, on biodiversity net gain. They have been controversial. I think that there is an element of anxiety in the potential to offset impacts. So that's kind of planning law, which relates to property. Um, I'm not sure what you meant in terms of rights of ownership. Can, would you be able to elaborate what you mean by that question? Sorry. Um, you mean about the community right to buy in yeah, Scotland? Yeah, so, so you said that it might infringe on people's rights, people's property's rights. Um, yes, I mean the, the rights of property owners to have um, extensive say on what they do with the property. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. So, I mean... Obviously, everyone does have that right. I th there are other avenues of law where you can kind of bring nuisance claims. So, for, for example, if you think about a river, um, it's fragmented into lots of parcels of land and ownership. And, and I think every owner owns half the actual river itself from, from their bank. Um, and, and that's problematic, right? Because what they're doing to their land is going into the river and it's then feeding down to other people's land. And, but they have the right to do whatever they want to do on their land. But I think there are claims, and again, I'm straying way out of my expertise here, but because but, every lawyer doesn't know everything about every law, um, but there are rights um, to bring claims in nuisance, for example. And, and so there are other ways to tackle it. I think the Environment Agency, I've heard it said that they're the, the main body that can bring litigation in terms of this, but they do not have enough funding to be able to, they're not taking a very active role in, in, in that. That's a very UK um, perspective. In terms of the international situation, something that might be worth looking at is the emerging rights of nature. I mean, it's not property law as such, but the emerging rights of nature. So you'll get regions that, that, that get declared to have their own legal person. So either natural features like rivers or mountains or, or certain the whole region itself in, in different places like New Zealand and India, they have various different legislative level or local legislation where they're, give, they're giving those rights to nature itself. And that can be a way to overcome that in terms of being able to overcome land rights. But again, we need to think about I'll be in trouble if I don't mention the indigenous element here. Uh, quite often that's, that's um, linked to indigenous rights. For example, that, that community has already been exercising rights that are very much in harmony with nature. And we haven't seen that happening very much in places like the UK where we don't have an indigenous population. But it, I know that a lot of people are thinking about this and thinking about ways that that can be overcome. I hope that answers your question and doesn't go off too Thank much you. of a tangent. We have a mic back here. And can I just ask, when you finish, can you hand it to the chap behind you? Because he's been waiting for a long time. Thank you. James Pilkington, Zoological Society of London. We work on nature both from a risk perspective and from an investment opportunity perspective. And from on the opportunity side, you know, we've been successful in launching green financial products, new businesses that are nature positive. 
but those benefits to nature have been incidental uh, to the product being produced and therefore the investment being attracted. And to the extent that we're able to create businesses and projects which are able to generate revenue from biodiversity improvements, we've really limited by the existence of markets for nature. So it's very specific geographies and circumstances like biodiversity net gain in the UK or nutrient neutrality. Um, so, but my question to the panel is, what role can financial institutions could play and would want to play in order to push governments to create the regulatory frameworks that can actually create markets for nature? Who wants to take it? Just Johan. a quick reply. Uh, this uh, touches on one of the big challenges, which is who's going to pay? If we're going to restore a lot of nature, it's not going to be for free. And it can be taxpayers, it can be companies, and, and uh, I mean, this is something everybody struggles with. Before, we have financing in the way, I mean, investors, uh, as a bank, you lend money. If, you're a, if, you're a, if you invest in equities, you sort of invest in a company that's supposed to uh, produce revenue, etc. So it's going to be uh, someone going to have to pick up the check. And this is a very important thing because today, and I think that was what Bob Eccles implied this morning, is that the, the demand for green investments are bigger than the supply. There, and hence you have a greenium. Yeah. So this is very much political decisions, uh, starting these restoring projects and these big infrastructure things. And, and so it, it would probably bo be both taxpayers and, and companies, but I mean, this is the mechanism that has to come in place. Jessica. Great, um, thank you for the question. Um, so I want to talk about the banking sector particularly because that's the industry platform we have that is, I would say, the furthest ahead uh, on figuring out how to implement the global biodiversity framework and getting more into the operational realities of it. Uh, so we do have a group of 35 banks who are working with us now to interpret the GBF into portfolio targets for impact. So for example, the 30 by 30 target, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Keith mentioned but also for processes in the banks. So we are able to look at, for example, what's happening in the Net Zero Banking Alliance. And for example, you know, they have scenarios, they have definitions of transition planning, they have ways of screening finance to say this is Paris aligned or it's under engagement or it's a climate solution. And we're at the starting line to go in that direction for banks on biodiversity. But actually, as we are going through this process, we understand, you know, sometimes banks know the use of proceeds, sometimes they have to look at a client level, you know, there's a lot of boxes to unopen. But, you know, coming back to this issue, there are simply not, you know, a huge pipeline of bankable projects and even, you know, potentially investable um, companies that are just waiting for capital. There is a pipeline matching problem. And I think realistically saying, you know, there is a pipeline matching problem, having gone through the work to show that and to, you know, show sincere effort to look for those opportunities opportunities, it's a lot more compelling than banks simply standing back and saying, well, there's no opportunities here, you know, not our fault, nothing to do. And actually, that's where the conversation with regulators, with policymakers comes in. And I'm glad that you mentioned the, the UK's biodiversity net gain, because we do have a huge, uh, you know, conflict right now in the biodiversity offset space, the biodiversity credits conversation, you know, some people are saying there is simply no market for voluntary biodiversity credits without a regulatory angle or without a, you know, a forget, a, an Article 6 equivalent in the CBD as compared to the UNFCCC where you can trade these credits. And others are saying we simply can't go in that direction because like for like is not possible with biodiversity. It's so localized. But what's interesting about the UK, and I'm not endorsing it, I'm just, you know, saying this is a, an interesting example that, we, you know, we can watch and see what happens is that the biodiversity net gain if you cannot after going through legitimately going through the mitigation hierarchy you can't create net gain on your individual site you can start looking for i don't i don't have the term here i think it's a biodiversity uh, gain site immediately close to your development 
And you can look a bit further, but it, you know, the cost increases and increases and increases as you go further. So it really emphasizes that localization of biodiversity. So again, I don't want to say I'm endorsing the UK's strategy, but it's an interesting one in trying to mix this fact that, you know, potentially even after implementing the mitigation hierarchy, considering all the other needs of society, you know, for our food and energy, et cetera, we might not be able to net gain biodiversity, you know, at a certain site you know, potentially there are options to manage this, uh, which, you know, which are creative and innovative. And again, you know, we are facing a situation of urgency where there simply isn't, you know, a, a huge money box of public finance to, you know, solve everything. We have to look for private solutions where private makes sense, not only, you know, looking to private sectors to solve things, but where it actually makes sense and it contributes to these higher goals that as a society we agree on. Look, just, just a very quick comment in addition to, to my colleagues here is I think you've raised a really important point or really important question about the role that banks and other investors in the financial markets have in engaging with governments on public policy. Um, you know, historically, you know, when I was running an NGO for a few years before that, th what we heard from the politicians, the politicians were only hearing from those companies, investors uh, and banks that didn't want the change as opposed to getting the progressive companies to stand up and say, actually, you know what, rather than being quiet and, and, uh, and modest, you've got to take a more active role to engage with politicians, to encourage them to be bold. And I think you raise a very important point about the role going forward, because my view, I'm sure, sure shared by a lot, is that we, a lot of the systems change we need can't be done without a certain degree of sensible, smart, regulatory policy leadership. But I emphasise sensible and smart. You can have bad policy and bad regulations that are counterproductive. Um, but that engagement from the community, the, the finance community, um, is very important. Now we can do that through individually. You can do it in a collaborative way, or we can do it with other bodies like UNEPFI and like Business for Nature is a really good one that we're very active in getting um, some of those targets into some of the, 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 the sections into the Kunmin Montreal Agreement. So it's a really, really important point, priority, and I think all the banks and investors need to really think about it. Yep. Great. We're running out of time, I'm afraid. This is <laughs> probably the last question. Oh, you have the mic. You get it. <laughs> I, I can be quick. Just, just a second. He's been waiting a long time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not even that good a question. Um, uh, one thing I thought was interesting in the GBF is that it talks about... Um, consumption and one way of looking at the biodiversity crisis uh, is it's a you know a crisis of consumption and we're not going to consume our way out of it even with all the agri-tech and green tech we can muster so I just wonder what the panel thought we'd do with this you know governments particularly you know in the UK and the US are very you know anti telling people what they should do there's a real worry about kind of perceptions of nanny state and voter reactions but someone at some point has to address this conception of uh, uh, sorry this you know, issue of consumption. So I just wondered, what do we do with that? Go ahead. Uh, short comment, uh, and it's sort of relating to the last question is that we did a deep dive on water in Sweden. And, and I mean, we're a small country and we are a wealthy country, sort of, and, and people are prepared to pay high taxes, etc. But we still have a problem with the water infrastructure. And, and why is that? Well, for one thing, we have a law that doesn't allow to make a profit out of water. So you can cover your cost, but you can't make a profit. That means that all private actors are leaving. And, and, and the, the end result, it's an overconsumption and underinvesting in this. And this is a general problem when it comes to natural resources in, in so many different ways that when you don't have a price on it, nobody wants to invest and the consumption is uh, uncontrollable. So I think in general what you need is some sort of mechanism. Uh, and when you come to biodiversity, there's, I mean, it's a problem, it's so complex, it's different things and in different regions. On the other hand, local, the, the effect of biodiversity problems, it's much more tangible on a local level. When it comes to carbon, it's sort of a global thing that someone else has to solve. So I think 
that could at least be you know, something uh, that make you a little bit more hopeful that the, the people will suffer sort of who doesn't manage their assets, their natural assets on a, on a local level. I, I'm going to be slightly contrarian. Okay. <laughs> Planet Tracker has been doing a lot of work on seafood and in the open oceans, nobody owns the resource. And so, you know, you can put a price on what it costs you to catch them and what you can get on the market. But if nobody's owning that resource, it's very hard to say, well, it's being managed in any sort of way. So, you know, seafood stocks, as many of you may know, are at 90% stressed at this stage in the open oceans because there is no management of it. So, you know, pricing Yes, but then there has to be policing on some level at some stage. There has to be some global regulatory framework for that. So consumption isn't, I, I, I'm, I'm always a little bit scared of blaming the consumer. So something else Planet Tracker is working on is in a coalition of other nonprofits where we're doing work on the advertising agencies. And whoever in this world asks for a protein bar that makes you sick and gives you diabetes and you're obese because you're eating it, nobody did. There's this push from the advertising and the marketing of products that is the responsibility in our feeling of the producer. Consumers are being hooked on addictive products, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the consumer who's demanding these products. So isn't it the producer that needs to be giving the right products to the market as well? I'm just saying that as a there's a consumption problem of overeating the wrong kinds of food. And if we adjusted that, we could adjust some of the, the issue in the supply chain as well on the consumption side. So I, I just want to say that you know, there are different ways of looking at this as well. But um, we had one more question. <laughs> I actually have three questions, uh, if that's okay. <laughs> but obviously not all of them have to be answered, and two of them are actually for specific panelists, so hopefully. I'm Jeanetta Sedelakova. I am a climate and biodiversity risk lawyer, and I work with Jenny, so I'm not asking Jenny any question. But I want to ask, so I liked how you started the panel, Robin, you asked us like, how does it feel like the impact of biodiversity loss? We remember them because we lived them. But I wonder, like we don't have individual memory of how a good relationship between mm -hmm. our economy and biodiversity looks like. But then we do have the collective memory, right? And that's with the indigenous people. So Jessica, I want to ask you, what is UNEPFI doing to bring those indigenous people on panels like this, like before us, so that actually we can hear their memories because we have lost them. My second question is for Johan. So you mentioned two points where I almost felt like um, they're almost like halting our progress. So you said biodiversity and complexity is overwhelming. And then a while ago you asked who pays for this, right? Questions that almost don't have answers. And I wonder whether you could reflect on simple answers to these questions. So the first simple answer is, if something is too complex for us to understand, the answer is do not mess up with it. And then who pays? Well, the polluter pays, right? The one who caused the harm. Could you just reflect on those simple answers? And then for the whole panel, Jenny, I'm quoting Jenny now, biodiversity loss is driven by five factors, pollution, climate change, more of them, right? So there is this argument that I keep hearing, which says biodiversity loss and disclosures and, na and the frameworks are going to subsume pollution. They are going to subsume climate change because everything is linked to biodiversity loss. And I wonder, what do you think about that? As each panelist, if we have time, Robin, sorry. <laughs> We're almost uh, out yeah, of time. So. That's my last question. Thank, Thank you. you. Johan, you want to start? Yeah, so uh, the complexity question is, yeah, and this is something I'm, I'm sort of, I think it's interesting because it's hard. Uh, one of the main problems is sort of legacy, uh, um, thinking about things, for example, a company. Um, I had a board member uh, a couple of years ago. I said, we have actually two goals here. We're going to give people a good pension. That's what we do. We have assets. And we have sustainability goals. And this board member said to me, no, you're wrong. We have one goal. We're going to provide pensions. Then we have one restriction. We can't do it the best way we want to. So that's another perspective on the same situation. I mean, we have the rules we have. So. And this is an example of a, an interpretive framework. And I think that we need enough complexity in our way to thinking about it, but we still have to simplify it because it's, it's just 
unmanageable. So, and this is the balance that we need. We probably need more complex frames than we have had historically, but we have to simplify. So that's one. The other one, who pays? I mean, this is, this is the, the question that has to do with pricing and with, with uh, one easy uh, answer that I don't think work would, say, would be to say that tax, taxpayers are going to pay for everything. This is, governments have to do this. It's going to be too much. It's going to be too expensive. And it's very, in, in the long run, it will not work in a, in a global market economy. So it's going to have to be some sort of, I mean, if, if, if you look at it as an externality, it has to be internalized of the, the resource intensive organizations. But this is easy to say, it's very hard to do. So I'm looking at it, what are the challenges here? Well, one is the complexity, another is to actually get the financial mechanism to get enough money to restore nature or whatever you want to do. Thank you, very quickly. Jessica, you and I were talking about this over lunch. Why aren't there more Southern voices on these panels? And also just to clarify, there are indigenous people in the north as well, uh, um, northern hemisphere as well. But I think that's a great question and I really, you know, I, I appreciate the question. I think um, this is something that we've started to think about. So UNEPFI, we deal with banking, insurance, investment. You know, this is the global biodiversity framework calls on finance to reach indigenous people, local communities, women for nature. And so absolutely, I think this needs to be much better connected. One of the uh, initiatives I mentioned was the communities advisory panel for biodiversity credits markets. But one area that I think is particularly powerful when speaking with uh, financial institutions is the topic of deforestation. So we have at various points had communications between forest defenders and financial institutions in other forums. Uh, but I think it needs to happen more because we're you know, I would say also on the climate side, we're failing to link the topic to the people who are actually both affected but have solutions. And so we're saying, here are solutions, and we're having a conversation, you know, in um, absence of the people who we're saying, you know, have solutions to bring to the table. So I definitely think it's, it's something that needs to be addressed uh, more. So I appreciate the question. Thanks. And Jenny, very briefly. Oh, um, I thought you didn't want me to answer the question. <laughs> Um, okay, that's all right. <laughs> I, I, you two can answer okay. it afterwards. We're, we're at time, so I want to thank everybody for joining us, and thank you to this great panel for all the inputs that you've given. <laughs>